Good evening, everybody. How's it going tonight? So good to have you back. Thanks for uh, coming back for the second session tonight. So there is a handout. If you have not picked one of those up yet, I hope that you will. That will help you follow along and uh, hopefully take a few notes, but it will give you kind of a rough outline of where we're headed tonight. Before uh, we dig in, let me point out another one of the books from the book table that I'd recommend. I'm not recommending that everybody read all of these, but you may want to pick one and just kind of use it. So this is Mark Knoll's book, Turning Points, which is a look at turning points in the history of Christianity, the history of the church, looks at 13 different ones, 13 different points in history that were turning points. It's uh, quite well done, uh, very helpful. I read three of the chapters from this book in preparation for tonight, and then next week, Brad is going to be teaching. We'll be looking at the medieval period. Uh, this book covers two crucial turning points from that time period. So it'd be helpful uh, if you want something a little briefer to read than a full church history, then something like that you might find useful. So let's begin with a word of prayer tonight, and then we'll dig in. Father, we thank you once again for a day of worship and of celebration. We thank you, Lord, for a wonderful time in worship this morning and celebrating the baptisms of uh, seven young people committing themselves to discipleship and to following Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you for the joy that we have when we come together. And we thank you for this time, for this space, for us to uh, do something a little more educational where we're learning about the history of the church. In doing this, we're learning about the history of the world, the history of Christianity, and history that affects our own lives as well. And we're also studying how you have worked in history to preserve the gospel and to preserve your people and have brought us to this present day. And so we pray that you just bless this time together tonight. May it be edifying and encouraging and instructive, and help us in all the ways in which we need. And we'll give you the praise and the glory for that. We pray this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Why study church history? And I want to begin with this quotation from J.I. Packer. It's giving us another angle on the answer to this question. J.I. Packer said, Tradition is the fruit of the Spirit's teaching activity from the ages as God's people have sought understanding of Scripture. It is not infallible, but neither is it negligible, and we impoverish ourselves if we disregard it. That's important for us to remember when we turn to the part of church history that we're looking at this evening. This is, of course, the second of six weeks. Last week we looked at the early church and really that period of the apostolic fathers and the apologist and the old Catholic fathers. We're looking at those first 300 years or so of church history, and in some ways it was one of the, the purest points in the history of the church, and tonight we're looking at this period that we might call the age of the Christian Roman Empire, because things really begin to change uh, right around the year 300 or shortly thereafter. And there are lots of things that happen in this time period. There are lots of things that kind of begin to solidify in the church that will shape the church for the next thousand years or so and things that we still live with today. There are perhaps things that we'll study tonight that you'll think, you know, I really disagree with that. I don't think I like like where that's going. And yet it's good for us to study these things because it helps us understand where the church has come from. It helps us understand some of the controversies that still frame our conversations today, and in some ways it will help us have a better understanding of what the scriptures actually do teach, and that will especially be true when we begin to consider the controversies surrounding the person and the work of Jesus Christ. Tonight I'm dividing things into four parts, and we begin with what I'm calling the birth of Christendom, the birth of Christendom. And I almost feel like I need to start this section with a scroll, like the episode of a Star Wars movie that's giving you the state of the empire <laughs> in order to understand what's going on. 
uh, because we do have to understand something of what was happening in the Roman Empire before the conversion of this man Constantine, who eventually became the emperor of the Roman Empire, and the effects that that had on the church. And we could begin by looking at the persecution under Diocletian. This was the final empire-wide persecution of Christians. The last one had been under Dacius. That had been the most severe of all. But Diocletian was concerned with a reorganization plan for the Roman Empire, and he divided the empire into four regions. These four regions were to be governed by two Augusti, assisted by two Caesars, and one of those four sub-governors was Constantius Chlorus, otherwise known as Constantine. He was over Spain, North and South Gaul, and Britain. And in three Uh, 303, the great persecution began. It was at the instigation of one of the other sub-governors, Galerius, but Diocletian supported it, and he supported it because he wanted to suppress anything that would bring disunity, that would bring anarchy into the empire. He wanted to unify the empire. He wanted rule, and so a number of things were proposed, and some of this was carried out. Christian buildings were to be leveled. The scriptures were to be burned, Bishops were to be imprisoned, and sacrifice to the gods was obligatory. This was the persecution that happened in this decade, about a decade before the conversion of Constantine, which happens in 312. So Constantine, who had been one of these rulers, is gradually kind of working his way up into power. A little bit of context on Constantine. His father had been a Neoplatonist, but his mother had been a Christian. Her name was Helena. And Constantine, it seems, before a major battle at the Milvian Bridge outside of Rome, had a vision. And scholars debate exactly what this was. Was it a vision? Was it a dream? Was it made up? But it seems like he had some kind of legitimate religious experience, the vision of the Cairo monogram, which you have on your hand out there. And it's really the two letters from the Greek alphabet that are the first two letters of the name Christ or Christos in Greek. And he had a vision of this sign or this symbol. And with these words, under this sign, conquer. And he was moved then to pray to the Christian God. He puts the signed this symbol on the shields of his soldiers, and he won the battle. And from that point forward, he began to identify himself as a Christian, sort of. So here's the deal. He began to support Christians in many different ways, but he was not catechized, and he was not baptized until much later in his life, actually shortly before his death. So it seems like he wasn't fully Christianized. He was holding on to power, and yet he was sympathetic to Christianity. And so a number of things then happened that were very positive things. There were positive things that happened as a result of Constantine's conversion. And again, we don't know for sure like how legitimate the conversion was. Some people think this really was a legitimate thing. Eusebius is the one who wrote his biography, and Eusebius certainly eulogized Constantine and thought of him as a true Christian. Uh, One of the books I read kind of in preparation for this class, quoted from it last week, Alex Kreider's book, The Patient Ferments of the Early Church, believes that Constantine became a Christian, but only at the very end. Only near the end of his life was he really fully converted and finally submitted himself to baptism. But whatever the case, this change in Constantine and the policies that then he enacted brought about significant changes. Michael Haken, in his wonderful book, Rediscovering the Church Fathers, another one I'd recommend, says the public embrace of Christianity by a Roman emperor, Constantine I, in the second decade of the 4th century AD had such far-reaching effects that by the time he died, there was scarcely any facet of the public life of the empire or that of the church that was not impacted by his policy of official Christianization. Now, it's not that he declared Christianity the public religion. That didn't happen until Theodosius I, sometime later. But he did 
do away with the persecution of Christians. He outlawed crucifixion, and he began to build friendships and partnerships with Christians, and Constantine was concerned with unifying the empire, and so instead of viewing the Christians as a threat to stamp them out, he decided to join hands with them and let's, let's help them and let's use Christianity, let's use the church to bring unity to the empire. And so there are a number of great consequences from this and some not so great. So one consequence was less persecution. The Edict of Milan in 313 brought an end to this empire-wide persecution of Christians. And apart from kind of a brief period under the Emperor Julian later, there really wasn't much persecution of Christians as there had been before. But this also meant that there was now state involvement in the church and sometimes state interference in the church. And so Constantine is going to be a major figure as he calls the first of the great ecumenical councils, which we'll look at here in just a moment. But it also meant that Constantine and other emperors would be involved in church affairs from this point forward and in fact, this would be the case until there was a little thing called the American experiment, where there was separation of powers and the state could no longer have authority in the church. But for the next thousand years or more, really the next um, 1,200 years or so, there would be this kind of coalition between state and church, which is what we call Christendom. That's what Christendom is, is that there is this combination of Christianity with the powers of the state, where this becomes the dominant worldview. So you have state involvement in the church, but then along with that, you had a rise in nominalism and secularism in the church. Now, nominalism, that means people who were Christians, but Christian in name only. And secularism as a kind of radical commitment and piety that had often been expressed in the confessors and in the martyrs in the previous three centuries, that began to kind of go away because there wasn't that kind of suffering anymore. It was much easier to be a Christian. And so many believed that the church became more worldly in the centuries that would follow. So this was the birth of Christendom, a major turning point in the history of Christianity and indeed in the history of the Western world. And this leads us right into number two, the battle for orthodoxy. And here we're looking at the ecumenical councils, in particular, the first six ecumenical councils. And I really, out of those, I just want to focus on two the Council of Nicaea, the first Council of Nicaea, what kind of happened after that, and then finally the Council of Chalcedon. These ecumenical councils of the 4th and 5th centuries were, we might consider them the fire in which and the hammer and anvil on which the church's confessional Christology were forged. Some of the most important confessional documents that ever were handed to the church came out of this battle, this controversy. And it was a time of controversy, a time of church controversy, a time of political turmoil and stress with leaders of strong temperaments from very different cultures in opposing traditions who are standing toe-to-toe in the battle for orthodoxy. Now, we just need to know, it's not that the church had not confessed the exalted nature of Christ. They certainly had. And I want to read to you an excerpt from Jaroslav Pelican's wonderful book, the Emergence of the Catholic Tradition, a wonderful study on the development of church doctrine in the years 100 to 600. He says, The oldest surviving sermon of the Christian church after the New Testament opened with these words, Brethren, we ought so to think of Jesus Christ as of God, as of the judge of the living and the dead. The oldest surviving accounts of the death of a Christian martyr contained the declaration it will be impossible for us to forsake Christ or to worship any other. For him, being the Son of God, we adore. The oldest surviving liturgical prayer of the church was a prayer addressed to Christ. Our Lord, come. And Pelican goes on, clearly it was the message of what the church believed and taught, that God was an appropriate name for Jesus Christ. But here's the deal. 
before this belief and teaching developed into the confession of the Trinity and the dogma of the person of Christ, centuries of clarification and controversy had to intervene in the full range of this belief and its relationship to Christian doctrine had to be defined. And that's what's happening in the 4th and the 5th centuries. This had been the confession of the church, but what did it mean? What did it mean when we believe there's only one God? What does it mean to say that Jesus is God and can be worshipped as God, is the Son of God? What does that mean? What is the relationship between the one and the three, the one God and the three, Father, Son, and Spirit, the name into which people were baptized? What's the relationship between the one and three? And then what is the relationship between the person Jesus Christ, who is both divine and human? How is that to be formulated? That's what these councils were about. And the problem was simply this. The problem was that people could use biblical language. They could speak with the language of the Bible while teaching something which ultimately came to be judged as unbiblical. And folks, that still happens today. It still happens today where people use the name of God. They use the name of Jesus. They may even use the words Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But what they mean by that is not what the Bible actually teaches by that. And so the crisis point came with a man named Arius. Arius. Born somewhere in the 250s. Let me tell you a little bit about Arius. His career before 318, when his views became controversial, is somewhat shadowy. I'm here drawing from Michael Haken. He says it was in that year that he publicly claimed that only the Father was truly God. He was a presbyter in Alexandria. And he writes in a letter to Alexander, who is the bishop of Alexandria, that it's God the Father alone who is the cause of all and is without beginning. Now he could say, and he would say, that we worship Jesus the Son as God. But he would also say the Son had a beginning. But God the Father had no beginning. He would say that the Son was the first one that God had created. And he would go to the places of Scripture that talk about Jesus as the firstborn over all creation. So he was teaching that Jesus, the Son of God, was not equal to God. He wasn't the same as God. He wasn't eternal like God. There was, he wouldn't say there was a time in which he was not, because he would say it happened before time, but he would say there was that in which Christ was not. There was a point in which Christ did not exist. And Haken says, what was especially difficult about this conflict was the slippery nature of Arius' views. He could call Jesus God, but what he and his partisans understood by this term was very different from what Alexander and his friends meant by the term. For Arius, Jesus was God, but not fully God like the Father. Arius did not consider him the eternal God, sharing in all the attributes of the Father. In Arius' theology, the Son is really a creature, though the highest of all creatures. Well, this controversy is going on. And through a series of, of course, relationships and conversations and events, much too complicated for us to cover all of it tonight, Constantine, trying to unite the church in order to unite the empire, calls a council, a council, and it will be in this place, Nicaea, in 325, where two to three hundred bishops are present, and they're debating these, these issues, the doctrine and the teaching of Arius. And this is another turning point in the church, because this is the first time where there's a, a council that is to be binding on everyone, to be binding on all of the church. And it's not just that a confession of faith was to be made by those being baptized, but now all the bishops are expected to line up under whatever this consensus is. And the consensus is the first version of the Nicene Creed. It's not the version we use this morning. That will come a little bit later, but it, it was some of that. And it was clearly ruling out Arianism. 
So Arius and Arianism was considered ruled out. This was unorthodox. This was heretical. Um, he, he was no longer to be supported. Now, what happens in the years that follow is more controversy. And it's more controversy because there hadn't been actually enough clarification, enough definition, and so other things are beginning to slip in now. And one of the primary figures in this debate that will happen for the next uh, number of years will happen under Athanasius or kind of surrounding Athanasius. Athanasius was actually at the Council of Nicaea. He was not yet a bishop. He'd been an assistant to Alexander. He was also from Alexandria. But when Alexander dies, Athanasius becomes the bishop. And again, there's political things that are happening at the same time. So Constantine, in a number of years, will die in 337. And it's interesting what another uh, one of these scholars, this time Everett Ferguson, says. He says, in spite of all his rhetoric about restoring unity to the empire, the rule was divided among his three sons. All right, so he had been the sole emperor, but he dies and he divides the kingdom again. This is kind of funny. He says he may not have been consistent in his policy of unity, but he was constant in naming his children. Constantine II received Spain, the Gauls, and Britain. Constans received Africa, Italy, and Illyricum. And Constantius II received the East. He also had a daughter. Anybody want to guess what the daughter's name was? <laughs> Constantinia. <laughs> and my guess is if he had a dog, he had a dog by that name as well. And he got a new capital out of the whole bargain, and he named it Constantinople. Well, the problem is that after 340, when Constance took over in the West, and Constantius overcame him, a few years later, 350, so you've got brother against brother. Eventually, the one that ends up in charge of everything is sympathetic to Arianism. And so what that's going to mean is that these politics happening both outside the church and inside the church is going to mean that for Athanasius, for the rest of his life, sometimes he's going to be in and sometimes he's going to be out. And this will lead to him being exiled, kicked out of Alexandria five times. Five exiles. And when he's exiled, he's running off into the desert. He's in hiding. He's living with the monks, who we'll talk about here in a few minutes. But he's writing feverishly. And it's, it's literally Athanasius against the world. Athanasius contra mundum. That's what that phrase means, Athanasius against the world. And it seems like the tide is turning. It's going back to Arianism, but he's writing feverishly, trying to defend the orthodoxy, the definitions that had been settled at Nicaea. And one of his classic books was a book called On the Incarnation. Well, alongside him, there are a few others that help in the battle. Uh, some of these would be in the next generation, but they're helping. In the battle, and these are the Cappadocian fathers. And I just, I'm not going to spend much time on these, but just briefly tell you who they are. <clears throat> you've, you've heard me mention some of these before. The Cappadocian fathers, they were fathers. They were in this region of Cappadocia, in, um, I believe that's in Asia. And there's three of them Basil of Caesarea. Basil of Caesarea was one of the primary opponents of Arianism, and he wrote. One of the first and most important books in the history of the church on the Holy Spirit. It is a full-length treatise defending the deity and the distinct personality of the Holy Spirit. And he's writing against a group of people that were essentially known as the spirit fighters. They were fighting against the idea that the spirit was truly God. These were the Pneumatomachians spirit fighters. And so he's writing against them. He's writing against Arianism. And he says, we should never divorce the paraclete from his unity with the Father and the Son. For our mind, when it is lit by the Spirit, looks up to the Son, and in him as in an image beholds the Father. He, he wanted to hold the three in unity together, Father, Son, and Spirit. Basil's younger brother was Gregory of Nyssa. And Gregory of Nyssa gives us the formula, one essence in three persons a formula that will then be used, the next council, the Council of Constantinople in 381, will be used to define the Trinity, one essence in three persons. 
And then they had a friend. This was the second Gregory and the third Cappadocian father, Gregory of Nazianzus. And he was writing in opposition to another bishop who was beginning to go sideways. His name was Apollinarius. He was the bishop of Laodicea, kind of in the mid-4th century, around 361. And Apollinarius believed in both the humanity and the deity of Christ, but in a modified way. He believed that Jesus had a human body, but instead of having a human soul, Apollinarius believed that he just had the divine soul that inhabited the body. So he had a human body, a human exterior, but an entirely divine interior. He didn't have a human soul. And Gregory of Nanzianza says, no, this is not sufficient. If Jesus didn't have a human soul, then he couldn't have accomplished a full redemption for real human beings, for both soul and body. And he said, that which he has not assumed, he has not healed. But that which is united to his Godhead is also saved. And so they're, by, they're fighting these different battles. Well, there will be another council that takes place in 381. And this is the Council of Constantinople. And you can see in a chart here, and I won't go into detail on all of this, but this will kind of help you see the kinds of heresies, the names of the heresies that were being addressed in these first six councils, and then the contribution of each one of the councils to confessional theology. Nicaea dealt with Arianism and stated that the Son has the same divine nature as the Father, the two being one God. But there were still these other errors that were out there. And so the next council clarifies it. This is the Council of Constantinople. And the creed that we use this morning in our worship is really the Nicene-Constantinople creed. uh, With just one addition that came sometime later, the Filioque Clause, where it says that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and from the Son. That's added in the late 6th century. But this council clarifies that the Son is a distinct person from the Father and is incarnate with a human body and soul and also clarifies the deity and the distinct personhood of the Holy Spirit. Well, more controversies will arise. There's a controversy, and essentially these are between those bishops and those leaders and theologians who are from Alexandria on one hand and those who are from Antioch on the other. And they had two different emphases. In Alexandria, the emphasis was the Word incarnate as the Word in flesh, and they were concerned with the unity of Christ, and they would speak of Mary, the mother of Christ, as Theotokos, the God-bearer. This is the mother of God. But those in Antioch were objecting to that. They were concerned with the humanity of Christ, the Word united with a human being. And they wanted to say, no, Mary is not the God-bearer, she's the man-bearer. She bore the man, she didn't bear God. But what's happening is there's there's this attempted division between the human and the divine natures of Christ. And so it takes another several decades for this to get hammered out. And finally, you get a statement in 451 in the Council of Chalcedon where both of these ideas are being dealt with, and a council that kind of brings everyone together with a a new consensus statement. And I want to read to you this statement. It's on your handout there. This is one of the greatest statements of confessional Christology that has ever been produced in the history of the church. It's pretty short. You can read along. They said, we then, following the Holy Fathers, all with one consent, teach men to confess one and the same Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, the same perfect in Godhead and also perfect in manhood, truly God and truly man. Okay, so they're affirming the two genuine natures of Christ, of a reasonable or a rational soul and body. So against Apollinarianism, he says, he's got a body, but not a, he's got a human body, but not a human soul. And they're saying, no, he has a rational soul and body, consubstantial with the Father according to the Godhead. So against Arianism, against those who are saying that his nature was not the same as the Father, and consubstantial with us according to the manhood, in all things like unto us without sin, begotten before all ages of the Father according to the Godhead, and in these latter days, 
for us and for our salvation, born of the Virgin Mary, the mother of God, Theotokos. And the reason they could say that Mary is the mother of God is because the two natures are united in one person. The person who was born of the Virgin Mary is a human divine person. And he was truly God. And so they affirmed this. In all things like unto us without sin, begotten before all ages of the Father according to the Godhead, and in these latter days for us and for our salvation, born of the Virgin Mary, the mother of God, according to the manhood, one and the same Christ, Son, Lord, only begotten, to be acknowledged in two natures, inconfusedly, unchangeably, indivisibly, inseparably. This is countering another heresy. It was wanting to say that the natures are not distinct, but they're combined into a new kind of nature, or into one nature. This was called Eutychianism. The distinction of natures being by no means taken away by the union, but rather the property of each nature being preserved and concurring in one person and one subsistence, not parted or divided into two persons. Now that's countering another heresy, because there are some who are going so far as to say, there's actually two. There's Jesus the man, and there's Christ the word. It's two different persons. And they're saying, no, there's not two persons, there's one person. Two natures, but united in one person. Not parted or divided into two persons, but one and the same Son, and only begotten, God, the Word, the Lord Jesus Christ. As the prophets from the beginning have declared concerning Him, and the Lord Jesus Christ Himself has taught us, and the creed of the Holy Fathers has been handed down to us. That's a very careful statement. That's a very precise statement of Christology that is showing us that Jesus is one person, Jesus Christ, the incarnate Son, the Word made flesh, one person with two natures. He's truly man, and he is truly God. Well, the councils go on, but let me just make one final comment here before we transition to the next point. One of the things to note here is that the language that's used in the creeds is actually language that largely had been crafted from the careful work of some of the theologians who went before. So the language of the revised Nicene Creed, from 381, the Nicene Constantinople Creed, a lot of that language comes from Athanasius and from the Cappadocian Fathers. And at Chalcedon, there was actually something read that used a lot of this language that made it into the definition, and it was read from Leo I, who was the bishop of Rome. And he had a couple of legates there who, were, who read this, and they were reading something from Leo's tome. That's what it's called. But it was Leo's articulation of the person of Jesus Christ. This doesn't mean that these definitions were the sole work of these theologians, not at all. They did represent to a large degree the deliberated consensus of the gathered church leaders of the respective councils. But the links with the great theologians remind us of something. It reminds us of the value of theological work for the church. Because what theologians are trying to do is pursue precision in their formulations of key teachings of Scripture so as to rule out the false teachings that might use the language of the Bible, but actually end up teaching something that is contradicting other parts of the Bible. That's what theology is trying to do. Theology is trying to rule out the errors by getting at the most precise formulation of a doctrine possible that takes into account all of the data of biblical revelation. And that's what these leaders were doing in these great councils. All right, point number three. We're moving now to another crucial aspect of the church in this time period, and it is the retreat to the desert or monasticism. And some of you might be thinking, why in the world are we even spending time talking about monasticism? I mean, these hermits that are in <laughs> the desert and these monks are living alone and all these kind of weird kind of mystical stuff, what does, what does that have to do with us? But there's some things we need to know about monasticism. You need to know, first of all, that it was a reactionary movement 
It was a reactionary movement as Christians were concerned with the secularization and the increasing worldliness of the church. And in reaction to what they saw happening in the church and in a desire to pursue holiness and to pursue godliness, they were retreating into the desert, into these communities. There are actually two different kinds of monasticism. There is Aramaic monasticism, and these were the ones who lived in solitude. But there was also Kenobetic monasticism, and these were communities of people, uh, communities of men and eventually communities of women who are living together, the men with the men and the women with the women, and they are seeking to pursue God together, and then taking this threefold vow, the vow of poverty, chastity, and obedience. There's a number of key figures that it's worth highlighting from this movement. First of all, Antony, another one of these, well, late 3rd and early 4th century figures. Antony's biography was actually written by Athanasius. So when Athanasius retreats into the Egyptian desert in his exile, he's spending time with monks, and I guess he does some research, and he writes this biography of Antony. And that biography, get this, will be a key influence in the conversion of St. Augustine. Now, if you read it, which I did about a year, year and a half ago, if you read it, here's what you're going to find. You're going to find a, a mix of edifying material that encourages you and kind of inspires you. There's a mix of that with some really strange, hard-to-believe stories about miracles and especially these physical combats with demons. It's, some of it's some pretty strange stuff. It really is. And I think it would be true to say that some early Christian biographies, sometimes they prioritized what they considered to be edifying over what they knew to be factual. And so sometimes we end up with what's called hagiography, where you have an idealized portrait of a saint or a figure, and you've got lots of embellishments, maybe even legends that get attached to it. And you shouldn't read that as if it is the kind of history that's being done today in a biography where you've got you know 50 pages or 100 pages of footnotes at the end that's documenting everything that took place in in letters and in conversations and so on it wasn't like that nevertheless some of it is edifying reading and this book was used by god in the lives of others and antony in his life will be instrumental in providing a model for a hermit's life in the following centuries another key figure is john cassian john cassian He introduced Egyptian monasticism to the West, and he left behind some books called The Conferences and the Institutes, which are filled with helpful insights on sin and on virtue. Then you've got this strange figure, maybe you've heard of this one, Simeon Stylites. Simeon Stylites. He was a Syrian ascetic who, get this, lived on top of a pillar for 37 years. People would put food in a basket. He'd pull the basket up to the top. He'd eat his food. And people would get, I mean, they would travel, gather all around to see and hear from Simon or Simeon Stylites. The Greek word style means pillar. And stories like these kind of stand out when you read about the monks and the monastics. And they show you just how strange people can be. Like there's some really strange stuff that happens in the history of the church. But that wasn't most of the monks. That wasn't most of them. There were many monks who were simply trying to be faithful Christians, making these serious commitments to Jesus Christ. And a lot of times they were then involved in the life of the church. So Basil of Caesarea, that I mentioned a few minutes ago, was actually a monk. And he founded his own monastic order that became very influential. And then a couple of centuries later, Benedict, the founder of Western monasticism, wrote the rule of St. Benedict which was a foundational text for shaping monastic life for the centuries that followed, and even down to this day. Now, let me acknowledge, certainly there were errors that came out of monasticism. On one hand, like one of the things that kind of grew out of this is this sense of a two-tiered Christianity. So you've got all the ordinary people who are trying to earn a living and have families, and just kind of do ordinary life, but you've got the really, really devout, holy people who are retreating to the desert, and they're giving up marriage, they're giving up sex, they're giving up possessions, they're taking these vows, and these are the really, really spiritual people. And that kind of two-tiered Christianity kind of grows out of 
the monastic movements. Certainly some of the monastics in many of the fathers from this period of church history had an overly negative view of many good things in creation. They had an overly negative view of sometimes marriage and certainly of sex within marriage. Uh, Sometimes they had an overly negative view of other kinds of things as well. They didn't quite have a grasp on the goodness of the created order. So there's errors for sure. But I want to point out some benefits because whether you know it or not, you today are a beneficiary of what the monks did. Okay? And I want to point out four things. First of all, scholarship. The preservation of sacred texts. Do you know that it was the monks in their monasteries who are largely responsible for copying and preserving the Bible? So that now we have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of manuscripts, right, of different parts of the Bible, hundreds of manuscripts and other old texts, and a lot of these were copied by monks, kept in monasteries, preserved over the centuries for us. Also, spirituality. The monks give us some helpful things in spirituality. Two things in particular were fixed hour prayer. The seven daily hours. Some of you maybe even use this. It's, the idea was based on Scripture. Psalm 119, 164. Seven times a day, I praise you for your righteous rules. And you can see in the sidebar what those times were in the mind of Benedict. And it's interesting that even the reformers, when the reformers get on the scene in the 16th century, John Calvin actually takes some of the, the writings and the thinking of the monastics, and according to various people who have talked about this, he, what he essentially does is he democratizes it. He tries to make this for everybody. And if you read carefully Calvin's writings, Calvin actually wrote prayers to be prayed at different times of the day, and he wasn't doing this just for the monks. He was wanting to do this for every citizen in Geneva because he wanted them to build their life around prayer. Also, the seven deadly sins. I mentioned this morning, the seven deadly sins are really formulated by the monks, beginning with the eight thoughts, the eight deadly thoughts or sinful thoughts or the eight demons, as sometimes they were called. And eventually that list gets reduced down to seven by Gregory the Great. So they give us certain things in relationship to spirituality. Number three, theology. Monks were the primary theologians from 600 to 1500. Listen to this. This is from Jaroslav Pelikan. I thought was quite an interesting insight. He said, during the years 100 to 600, most theologians were bishops. From 600 to 1500 in the West, they were monks. And since 1500, they have been university professors. Gregory I, who died in 604, was a bishop who had been a monk. Martin Luther, who died in 1546, was a monk who became a university professor. Each of these lifestyles has left its mark on the job description of the theologian, but also on the way doctrine has continued to develop back and forth between believing, teaching, and confessing. That's important for us to know. And some of the theologians we've covered tonight and some we're yet to talk about, including St. Augustine tonight, And Thomas Aquinas, next week, were monks who were doing theological work. And then finally, a fourth thing we could appreciate about the monastic movement was their concern with mission. It's something of a misnomer to think that the monks just retreated into the desert, didn't care about anybody. The fact is they were a force for evangelism and for mission and for doing good deeds and trying to help and to serve people. And Mark Adol says, if we pray for the success of Christian missions, we ask for blessing on enterprises pioneered by the monks Patrick, Boniface, Cyril, and his brother Methodius in Raymond Lull. And he gives the time periods for each of those times. You might remember Patrick, at least, because we celebrate St. Patrick's Day. Well, Patrick was this uh, guy who'd been a slave in Ireland, right? And he escapes, and then he goes back, and he takes the gospel to... Ireland and does tremendous mission work. He lived about the same time as St. Augustine, and he also left his confessions behind. He left a confession behind, and you can read a lot about St. Patrick. So there are things about the monks for us to appreciate, and some of these monks become figures that would be very important for 
the whole time period that would follow the medieval time period, and we might call these the fathers of Western Christendom. This is point number four. The fathers of Western Christendom, otherwise known as the four doctors of the church. All right, doctors of the church. That's a title that was given by the Catholic Church to saints who were recognized as having made a significant contribution to theology or doctrine through their research, study, or writing. And in 1298, Boniface VIII ordered the feast days of these four figures to be kept twice a year. And they are four figures who left their imprint on the church. And I just want to talk about them briefly. First of all, and most brief of all, Jerome. Jerome is best known for his Latin translation of the Bible, the Latin Vulgate. And this was the Bible for the church in the West up until Erasmus put together his Greek Testament, and then you've got the invention of the printing press. And then in the 16th century with Martin Luther and William Tyndale and others, the Bible begins to be translated and printed in the vernacular language of the people and distributed. But for over a thousand years, the Bible that the church was using for the most part was this Latin Vulgate from Jerome. And he was a scholar who spent much of his life putting together uh, this material and writing other things as well. And he's one of these four doctors of the church. Secondly, Ambrose. Ambrose was the bishop of Milan and was an opponent of Arianism during those Christological controversies. So we're walking back just a little bit in the fourth century. And one of the things Ambrose was famous for was his hymn writing and the way he affected worship in the church. And he left behind what are known as the Ambrosian hymns. Now, there's a couple of them. There's one that we've actually used, not so much singing, but we've used as a recitation, as a confession. It's called the Te Deum, and it's possible that Ambrose wrote that. It's certainly cataloged with the Ambrosian hymns. The authorship is disputed. But one we know he did write is called Come Redeemer of the Earth. Uh, This is an English translation, of course, of this hymn. But I want to read it to you, or at least a portion of it to you, because I think you'll see how he encapsulates the Christology that had been hammered out in uh, the years of these Christological controversies, and he puts it into poetic form. Come thou, Redeemer of the earth, and manifest thy virgin birth. Let every age adoring fall, such birth befits the God of all. Begotten of no human will, but of the Spirit, thou art still the word of flesh, Uh, The word of God in flesh arrayed, the Savior now to us displayed. From God the Father he proceeds, to God the Father back he speeds, runs out his course to death and hell, returns on God's high throne to dwell. O equal to thy Father thou, gird on thy fleshly mantle now, the weakness of our mortal state with deathless might invigorate. O Jesus, virgin born, To thee, eternal praise and glory be, whom with the Father we adore, in Holy Spirit evermore. Amen. Probably it would actually be a singable song. It's giving us the doctrine of the three in one, the three persons united in one being, and it's giving us the doctrine of the two in one, the two natures united in the one person of Jesus Christ. It's right there in the Ambrosian hymn. There are other things that Ambrose did as well. Ambrose uh, was probably one of the first of the church fathers, church leaders, to begin to collect relics and had quite a collection of relics of previous saints and martyrs and was collecting those in Milan. He greatly encouraged virginity and wrote a whole book on it. And he was, according to Michael Haken, a pioneer in new ways of thinking about the Lord's Supper. And while a full doctrine of transubstantiation would not come for many centuries, Ambrose, in his writings, talks about a change in the elements. And it's one of the the first places where we find that kind of language, where the early church fathers would certainly speak of the Lord's Supper as if there is a real presence, that Christ is present in the Supper, which I personally believe. But I believe he's present in the supper through the spirit. That was Calvin's view. But Ambrose is suggesting a change in the elements themselves 
And that eventually, of course, gets developed into the Roman Catholic doctrine of transubstantiation, where the elements are changed into the body and the blood of Christ, or the substance but not the accidents of the elements transformed to the body and blood of Christ. But Ambrose is probably most famous for something else, and that is his role in the conversion of St. Augustine, who is the third of these fathers for us to consider. Augustine's story is well known, and I've told it many times here, and maybe you've heard me tell it before. He recorded it in his book, The Confessions. The Confessions, which was in many ways the invention of spiritual autobiography. And in fact, we have the Confessions for sale in the bookstore, a wonderful uh, translation by Maria Bolding, read this a number of years ago, and I've read several translations of the Confessions, but this one is uh, particularly good. I would greatly encourage you to read it. It's a beautiful, beautiful book. Augustine begins by saying, Lord, you made us for yourself, and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. Our hearts are not at peace until they find peace in you. And it is the story of how God, by his grace, begins to work in Augustine's life and brings him out of a life of sin life of slavery to his own appetites, and especially his sexual appetites, and delivers him. And part of that deliverance will be when he reads the life of St. Anthony, written by Athanasius. In fact, he reads that, and one day he, he reads it, and he's so convicted. He's been wrestling for a long time, but he's so convicted as he considers the example of Anthony, who gave up so much even though he wasn't a greatly educated man. And he's comparing that with himself. He's got all this education in the classics, studied to be an orator and so on. But even with all of his learning, he can't control his appetites. And he actually retreats into a garden. He's praying and he hears the voice of a child. And the voice says, Tola lege, Tola lege, which meant take it and read. Take it and read. And he just looks down and there on the bench, there's a book. And he picks up the book. And it ends up being <laughs> a collection of Paul's letters, and he reads Romans chapter 13, and he reads several verses that become the instrument of his conversion. And it's just like all at once, the chains fall off, and his heart is free, and he begins to go to church there in Milan, and he hears Ambrose preach, and becomes a catechumen, and then he's baptized, and eventually, when he goes back to North Africa, Hippo, he eventually becomes the bishop there. And Augustine is known as the doctor of grace. The doctor of grace. Here's a statement by Albert Outler about Augustine and his view of grace. He said, the central theme in all Augustine's writings is the sovereign God of grace and the sovereign grace of God. Grace for Augustine is God's freedom to act without any external necessity whatsoever. To act in love beyond human understanding or control. To act in creation, judgment, and redemption. To give his son freely as mediator and redeemer. To endue the church with the indwelling power and guidance of the Holy Spirit. To shape the destinies of all creation in the ends of the two human cities, the city of earth and the city of God. Grace is God's unmerited love and favor, prevenient and occurrent. It touches man's inmost heart and will. It guides and impels the pilgrimage of those called to be faithful. It draws and raises the soul to repentance, faith, and praise. It transforms the human will so that it is capable of doing good. It relieves man's religious anxiety by forgiveness and the gift of hope. It establishes the ground of Christian humility by abolishing the ground of human pride. God's grace became incarnate in Jesus Christ, and it remains imminent in the Holy Spirit in the church. I think that's a good summary of Augustine's thought. And Augustine taught the sovereignty of God's grace, the necessity of God's grace, and the mediation of God's grace. And each one of those things involved a particularly controversial thing, or at least it would be controversial to some, that Augustine taught. I'll be brief here, but the sovereignty of God's grace, predestination. Augustine was the first theologian that I know of in the history of the church to write extensively about predestination. Now, his views were controversial then, they've been controversial since, and many, many people, both Catholic and Protestant, have taken a more moderate position than Augustine. But Augustine was later followed by Thomas Aquinas and then by Calvin and by many in the Protestant and the Reformed tradition. Now, of course, the real issue isn't what Augustine taught us, what does the Bible teach? 
this is not a Bible class tonight. This is a church history class. We're not getting into the scriptures tonight. We do that on Sunday mornings. But Augustine was certainly one of the, the great theologians of God's sovereignty in the history of the church. He also taught the necessity of grace, and in particular with his doctrine of original sin. Now, others had also believed in original sin, but Augustine really formulates it and systematizes it and is doing this in controversy with the British monk Pelagius. And the issue here was not just the sovereignty of grace, but it was the need for grace because Pelagius, at least according to Augustine, and there's debate as to what Pelagius actually thought, but at least according to Augustine, Pelagius denied that Adam's sin had been transmitted to all human beings. And according to Augustine, Pelagius thought that salvation was essentially a matter of the human will obeying, just obey and pursue virtue and you'll be saved without any need for an intervention, a divine intervention of God's grace. And Augustine was opposing this at every turn. And then the mediation of grace. The mediation of grace was through the church. And this would be controversial today for many Protestants especially, because his understanding of grace was closely tied to the church and especially to the sacraments of the church and his doctrine of baptism. In one theologian's words, in Augustine's theology of grace, infant baptism proved not only the universal necessity of grace, but also the objective mediation of grace. And the idea is that because human nature has been damaged by sin, it needs to be restored. And the way it's restored is through the church, through baptism, through which a person is regenerated. And therefore, every child that is contaminated with Adam's sin needed to be baptized in order to be restored to God's grace. Now, infant baptism did not start with Augustine, but he does connect the dots in a way that highlights this understanding of a sacramental efficacy to baptism and gives a deep theological justification for it. Now, I think we should acknowledge I do think a plausible case for infant baptism can be made from the New Testament. I'm not necessarily saying a persuasive case, but a plausible case. And defenders would point to things like circumcision as a sign and seal of the Old Covenant and the similar role that baptism plays in the New. They would point to the household baptisms in Acts where you've got whole households that seem to be baptized together, presumably including children. But that even if that's even if we grant that that's plausible, the New Testament does not explicitly ever say that infants are baptized. And in fact, the very first reference you have to infant baptism in church history is Tertullian, who is against it. And then Tertullian's successor, or at least a few years later, Tertullian of Carthage and then Cyprian of Carthage, Cyprian defends it. But Augustine, of course, really brings it to the fore. I'm almost done couple more comments here. Everett Ferguson says, in the Augustinian-Pelagian controversy, infant baptism was a principal support for the doctrine of original sin rather than the other way around, since baptism was universally recognized as for the forgiveness of sins. With the victory of Augustine's arguments, original sin became the reason for infant baptism in the Western church. Now, that would not be the case for many Protestants today who practice infant baptism. Most Presbyterians would deny that baptism in, in any way conveys saving grace in and of itself. They would deny the regenerating efficacy of baptism. They would say it's a sign, but it has to be connected with faith in the heart. But you can see how Augustine's view is shaping the church. I mean, that's my point here, that these four men who leave a legacy they leave a legacy that shapes the dialogue and shapes the church and shapes Western Christianity in the whole medieval period for hundreds and hundreds of years. And then finally, under Augustine, we should consider for just a moment his magnum opus, The City of God. It's been called the climax of Latin apologetics and the blueprint for the Middle Ages. It was Augustine's apologetic response to the fall of Rome. And the accusation was that because Rome has turned Christian, the old gods have abandoned Rome and that's why Rome is falling. And so Augustine takes this as a challenge where he writes this lengthy 22-book-long philosophical history contrasting the two cities, the city of man with the city of God. 
And he, what he's essentially doing in about the first half of that book is he's analyzing Roman religion and Roman philosophy. And he's showing that the Romans were not even true to their own principles. They weren't even true to their own gods. And he's showing the fallacies and the problems and the weaknesses there. And then in the second half of the book, he's looking at the origin and the history and the destiny of these two cities, the city of man and the city of God. This book, the city of God, is a cornerstone of Western thought that addressed many theological, philosophical, and ethical issues, and a lot of things we take for granted today. So, for example, Augustine is the first Christian to formulate anything like a just war theory, and he does that in the city of God. It's tough reading, but worth your time and attention if you've got the heart for it. Finally, one more father to continue uh, to consider, and that's Gregory the Great. Gregory the Great. And now we're getting to the end of the 6th century. Gregory has been called the last of the church fathers and the first of the popes. Now, there, w- there were precursors to this, including with Leo sometime before. But it seems that the papacy kind of begins to harden more and more into an institution and partly under Gregory. He's also been called the father of Christian worship because he shaped the liturgy of the Roman church uh, for many years. He was involved in mission, the Gregorian mission, uh, as well as with the worship, the Gregorian chants, like all this comes from Gregory the Great. He did wonderful pastoral writing, a book I have in my library called The Book of Pastoral Rule, and it's essentially a pastor's manual, and it's actually quite good. It's uh, very good material on how to do pastoral work. And I rather like the comment of John Calvin, who greatly admired Gregory, and he called him the last good pope. And whether that's the case or not, you'll have to come back next week to find out where Brad digs into it. But my point in bringing up Gregory is that he is one of these four doctors, and the papacy, as it would come to be understood in the medieval period, was, at least to some degree, shaped by Gregory the Great.